Hi, Rachel. Hi, Ann. Well, um, I'm Ann Althaus, and you're I'm Rachel, Rachel Clark. Clark. Yeah. <laughs> And welcome to Blogging Heads, but this is not your first trip through Blogging Heads. No, it is so. my third, but my first with you. It's really nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. You're out in L.A., right? No, I'm actually in New York. This is, um, oh, for you're... those who can oh. view at home, this is our, I gotta figure this out, this is our office. That guy right there is, I gotta figure out how to do this, is, oh, David Flumenbaum, one of our blog editors. It's his big moment. Hi. Of <laughs> yes. Okay, so you're in New York. Okay. Yes. And I'm in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Very nice. But isn't that um, isn't that where that seventy show is filmed? Hello, Madison. Is that right? Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah, you know, I never watched that show. I don't know why I don't. There's a bunch of crazy kids having fun. The seventies are after my time. I'm sort of a sixties person, and when I and I am going to make you talk about Bob Dylan in a little while. But I, I, I was thinking about Bob Dylan just as I was setting up the topics, and I was thinking about the way the topics hang together. And I hate to say this for the uh, for the viewers, but I think that the the topic looks like it's going to be something like uh, um, ennui and boredom and, and weariness. And I was thinking of the old uh, Bob Dylan line: uh, "My weariness amazes me," and I'm feeling weary. I'm weary of the. Uh, um, all the primaries that have been going on so long. And then the, the funny thing is that, that I, I, I got so used to them. I got so used to talking about, especially Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton every day, that uh, I really don't know what to do with myself because um, I got really tired of her hanging around. But I, I sort of miss having Hillary to kick around. I, I think that anymore. there's probably um, a just like a woman uh, joke to be made here, but I don't know what happened about Bob Dylan to be able to do that. <laughs> well, we're trying to maximize the Dylan quotations. Yes. No, so. I think we can. I think we can do it. How does it feel, <laughs> Hillary Clinton, to be on your own? Um, okay. Uh, I think uh, I, first of all, I didn't have to unweave so much as frustration with the constant calls for her to leave the race. I think um, mm-hmm. you know they started around the beginning of March. She actually mm-hmm. left the race. At the very end, and the reason she left at the very end was because there was no reason to make her do it earlier. Um, two months later, I think that's significant in a, a you know in a five month primary process um, that you know that the the calls for her to leave came about halfway through and she still hung around. Yeah, I know. I, I didn't agree with the calls for her to leave, but uh, but and, and but now I'm wondering is she. Is she really gone? I mean, the primaries came to their natural end, and then, you know, she waited a few days, she made her statement, everything looked like she was backing out and giving her support to Barack Obama, but I'm not convinced that really happened. You're not convinced that she actually... That she's did. really gone. I, uh, well, you know, I, I was writing a blog post about it. Right, what? I didn't, I didn't see ahead. your post about it. I don't, but she said in her, you know, in her speech, she said that she's not going to be gone. She's going to be out front leading the charge for, you know, disenfranchised people, as she always has been. Oh, yeah, but that doesn't count. I mean, gone as a candidate. I don't believe she's really given up. I think she's lying in wait, resting. On my blog post, I quoted the last paragraph of Camus' The Plague, where, you know, the uh, the quote is something like, the cries of joy are rising from the town. Everybody in town is happy because the plague is over. But the doctor, the main character, realizes that, uh, you know, the the plague bacillus never dies. It lies dormant. It bides its wow. time in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, and bookshelves. And perhaps and the day will come again. The day may it can always happen. It can always spring back into life. And uh, you know you may be happy now, but she, but she could come back. So um, I mean, that's, you know, a I lot of to people compare her to her a, a little pl- bit more positively than that. Well, I'm not saying she's. Uh, I know Samantha Power got in trouble for calling her a monster, and I'm not. And I'm not saying she's the plague bacillus. But isn't she really lying there, dormant, waiting to come back if anything goes wrong? Well, I, I mean, think she that, has the boat. Sure, yeah. So if something goes wrong, but you know, I don't. Anybody who lives our life planning for when things go wrong uh, probably are are enormously unhappy. I would think, um, and and I. I I would imagine that, you know, she's she's pretty much resigned to it. I mean, Howard Wolfson said on uh, The Situation Room this Sunday, you know, that he is going away. He's taking the summer off. I think that people are scattering. I, you know... I don't believe that. Re- why Why should we believe that? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I, well, I, got an, I just... emailed him and I got an away message. So... <laughs> That means something. I just think that uh, they have a strategy that could work, and I don't believe they've given up hope. But, you know, I mean... I, know, I mean, what I, proves that? I mean, what... Go- Barack Obama's proved that, you know, the audacity of hope can get you somewhere. But I think, I, yeah. I mean, at this 
yeah, I think she has the audacity. Read the the tea leaves. There's no, you know, the the only way for Hillary Clinton to come back as a candidate is is as a savior, and there's no evidence right now that that's necessary. And one thing we've learned from this whole primary experience is that things change, uh, and the unexpected happens, and you just never know. But um, we can only go on the basis of the evidence that we have before us, and I just I haven't seen any reason to think that. She well, I think the evidence is that she has a path to still get it, and I'm not going to believe she's really gone until he actually has the nomination, until the convention actually votes. Because it, all it takes is some superdelegates to change sides. They've already flipped back and forth a number of times, haven't they? Well, I think All they have to do is decide to vote for her that a he's really, a bad bet. There'd have to be a really good reason at this point, after all the superdelegate, will of the people, hoopla. Yeah. I, I think it would have to be just uh, extraordinary circumstances. Now, this has been an extraordinary race, right. but even so, I think... Um, I, I assume they dug up everything they could possibly dig up, and they've already thrown everything at him. I just won't right, unless, believe you know, it's Scarlett final Johansson answer until has it... some sort of secret, and she's uh, alarmingly indiscreet. But um, other than that, uh, yeah. I can't imagine. You know, they, they you know, what they, but Obama just just today um, launched this website, um, this this new fight the smears dot com, yeah, I believe is the address. I saw that. Um, to uh, to fight the misinformation about him. I think that is a brilliant idea, just, you know, going right for it and, and making it interactive and, and getting it out there. I think um, that may mm-hmm. actually convince some people that he's not a Muslim. Dare yeah, if you just have the right, if you just have the right website, people will, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think he almost has it sewn up. I'm just saying I don't believe it's 100%, and I don't believe she's given up hope. And I won't believe it until the convention votes. Well, I think that, you know, I don't, I don't think that Hillary Clinton wants or another Republican term. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe I'm not Machiavellian enough to, to imagine that anybody could. But um, you think she cares about the good of the party? Yeah, and the country. I think that there's there's a lot happening. You know, you can't walk go around the stump and and talk about how essential it is for the Democrats to get to get in place and and all the good that hasn't been done over the uh, over the past eight years of the Republican. Um, yeah. administration, and then, and I mean, to, to say all of that and not believe it, you know, that's got to be... Well, she'd have to be a very good actress, no. but maybe she is. I, I, I mean, I, I thought her speech on just, Saturday was great, yeah, I did and too. I think she, well, I, I think she did a good job of making it seem as though she really did care about the good of the country. Now, think, maybe all of that was laying the groundwork not, for her run in 12. But why, but why not? You know, who, because, I mean, who, what politician doesn't, you know, what person who has a long professional life ahead of them doesn't uh, operate, um, you know, in the present with a with an eye to the future. I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with her positioning herself for leadership, uh, whatever leadership role that may be. It may be VP, although who knows? I wouldn't count on it. Um, leadership in the Senate. Yeah. I mean, just leadership as a leading Democrat. She she'll always be, you know, a lioness of the Democratic Party. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and I think that I thought the speech was great. You know, I I, wrote I thought the about speech it, was great too. Thought it was lovely. And I'm not disrespecting her. I'm I'm respecting her. I'm saying that she actually may still be fighting. Well, you know what I just think is so interesting about Hillary Clinton is that um, we emailed back and forth with each other with a bunch of things to discuss and sort of yeah. uh, you know Hillary Clinton. She just everybody just loves to talk about her. Everyone just loves to talk about Hillary. Like her this, her yeah. speech was Saturday. And it, it's Thursday right. today, but um, you know, I'll probably be seeing this on Monday. So, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm keeping my own hope alive that I just want to keep talking about her. I've just gotten so used to talking about her, I just can't give it up. I think, you know, uh, you and uh, Chris Matthews, right? I mean, that, but I wrote that actually when I was when I, back in um, uh, Iowa. I did like a little uh, uh, media review of, of the candidates. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the things about Hillary Clinton, I said, you know, it depends on how you define love. You know, people love talking about her. They love dissecting her. They're a little obsessed with her and what makes her tick and what, what she's planning and why she yeah. do what she does and what is it about her that yeah. people love and hate. I mean, if, you know, if, if being that kind of topic for discussion and, uh, yeah. and constantly on people's minds. Right. What love, makes some people so compulsively talk about a bull? And other people, you don't even want to talk about them. Like, I've noticed uh, nobody really wants to talk about George Bush. I almost never write about him. I find him very hard to pay attention to. It seems as as if he's sort of a man of the past. 
though he is president. Well, he is a lame duck. So he's, I mean, he certainly had people talking about him a week or so ago with the Scott McCollum book, but again, yeah. only as a symbol of all that had been done wrong uh, yeah. in his administration. I mean, he is being talked about as as sort of the foil for all that yeah. is good and right in whatever but, administration will be. And that's not only Obama, yeah. that is that is McCain and McCain surrogates. I mean, um, you know, distancing themselves from George Bush. And I've heard... Um, a number of people now say that, listen, if it was anyone but John McCain, then I wouldn't vote Republican. But since it's John McCain, he's the only mm-hmm. one who can lead us, you know, to where we need to go. And, and I think yeah. you'll see that line of reasoning and that talking point more and more. Right. Sort of, I just think it's astounding. And change thing. I just think it's astounding that we pay so much attention to the primaries and have for, it seems like, the past two years or so, compared to how little attention we paid to the actual president. But uh, but with this obsession of, uh, on the future, I think feel like we need to stop and talk about the VP choice. But this is another one of these things that I'm weary about. Vice presidents aren't really very interesting and yet we, we need to talk about we need to talk about them because that's the uh, the current subject. Right. But uh, I'm wondering if there's anything here that isn't uh, completely uh, tiresome at this point. Is there anything about the vice presidential pick? Of either McCain or Obama that would that would excite you, other than by being boneheadedly stupid, <laughs> um, yeah, <you laughs> like know what? Gore. Are... Right? It was brought up the other day. Car- James Carville brought it up that uh, that uh, Obama should pick Al Gore. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's crazy. Doesn't make any sense. I mean, listen, yeah, Al Gore again, elder of the party, statesman. But if he was going to step in and take some sort of leadership role, it would have happened. By now, yeah. I cannot yeah. imagine that Al Gore would decline to run again for president at a time when he actually could have had that kind of momentum, and then you know retake VP. Like why, why, why bother? It would be uh, a step down for him. Right. You know, he's become this uh, grand figure. He really can't just go back to being a mere vice president. That would just look foolish. Uh, I, I just mean, even can't believe anyone could is it talking. Be satisfying. That's that's you know, and could that be the best platform for him to to do what he has discovered that he does best, which is change with respect to the climate. Um, I think the theory is that he would be empowered to work in particular on the climate issues and that he could bring some special stature to that. But does he need to be VP for that? That would be the job. Excuse me? Does he need to be VP for that? No, I don't think he should. No, no. Right. It would just be a way of bringing him into the administration and making him important that way, just like having Hillary Clinton as VP and then giving her the health care program would be a way of you know, internalizing what she represents into the administration. But I don't think either of those is a good idea. But anyway, so is there anything about VP that could excite you? Any Anything? Um, it's funny, you know, it's it's sort of, it feels like the, you know, like the news cycle is, is desperately hanging on to the VP thing, trying to make it yeah. exciting. Um, yeah. You know, looking at uh, Kathleen Sebelius. Is it Kathleen or Catherine? I, Kathleen, right? Um, yeah. And... Uh, you know, like looking at Jim Webb and Wesley Clark and, um, you know, Charlie Chris. Like, I, I don't know, it doesn't, so far I haven't been really super energized by it, but it's, it's really hard to go from you know, Obama versus Hillary, you know, neck and neck, um, to uh, the VP selection process and, yeah. and vetting. Yeah. I think what's been sort of interesting is the whole vetting notion has been taken to the nth degree, um, you know, the, the vetting of the vetters. And, uh, and the, the, right. the stepping out of Jim Johnson after a week after his appointment. Right, I know. But again, that's, yeah, that's, that's a blip. You know? Well, I mean, well, we, we were, we're judging Obama's management, his executive uh, powers, his, how good his judgment is there. So his picking of the bad vetter, it's bad. I mean, an awful lot of the people he's associated with, him, that he's associated with, have turned bad, like Jeremiah Wright. Well, so it reflects on his judgment. I don't know about uh, that's an awful lot. I mean, there, who else other than Jeremiah Wright? And um, there was Resco, but there's really no, you know, there's no actual association with him, you know, in a, in sort of a, a actionable way. Um, and uh, when you look at uh, McCain, there's, you know, the, the swirling controversies about Bill Graham and the, the lobbyist stuff and then and, and, and uh, Pastor Hagee, like, that's a huge one. Yeah. I mean, the, the, everybody made mm-hmm. such a big to-do about Jeremiah Wright, but Hagee was there longer and and uh, and McCain, you know, was sort of after all the Hagee stuff came out that he yeah. sort of waffled yeah. about just, whether or not It, it wasn't the same support. kind of 
close association, though, and it, it was a more politically motivated association. Right, as but opposed I to actually this. think that that speaks a lot um, more highly of yeah, Obama. Not, like, if you have a long-term association yeah. with someone and there's sort of a, a real relationship, um, mm -hmm. you know, be careful about how you do it. And I think that that was a progression. The right, the right thing was a progression. You know, probably no one could have predicted that he would come out swinging like that when he, you know, came in front of the National Press Association and Bill Moyers and all that stuff. Um, he really left him no choice. Yeah, but yeah, um, I yeah. tended to think that it was admirable that he stood by him. Um, how, I, yeah, well, if, it, I if, the, if the Wright had known his speech. place at that point and behaved well, it could have gone well after that first speech. But, you know, I was going to say, with respect to the uh, VP choice, the so one thing that I think would actually be exciting would be if McCain picks Sarah Palin, the governor of uh, Alaska. Oh, that's right. Though you had you Did you blog about that also? Yeah, a little, and I linked to a, a blog by a blogger named Beldar, uh, basically uh, amassing the evidence and, and uh, presenting her as a very attractive uh, figure, very interesting. Uh, oh, you know, a woman who uh, distinguished from Hillary Clinton in the sense that um, she made it on her own. She wasn't leveraged into power by a father or a husband. You know, I think she really kind of represents the uh, the real feminist values. Of course, the problem with her as a woman candidate is that she is pro-abortion, so she doesn't pick up the usual themes that feminists are, are looking for. But I think she's inspiring as a conservative, as a woman conservative, and that she would be an exciting choice for McCain. Well, here, I've got two points on that. The first is, you know, anything uh, coming out of Alaska has to be an improvement over Ted Stevens. <laughs> That's my first thing. Um, and the second point is just I, I, I want to be careful about saying, you know, with the implication that Hillary Clinton – uh, came in on the coattails of her husband. I mean, I think that I'm one of the people who thinks that maybe old fashioned, but marriage is a partnership. And it always irked me when people would say, you know, would would dismiss her experience of being in the White House for eight years as first lady. Because I tend to think that, uh, you know, in, I'm, I'm not married, but in when I'm in relationships, I certainly feel like I'm, I'm in a genuine partnership with the person that I'm dating, and I know what's going on in their life, and they know, they know what's going on in my life, and I turn to them for guidance and advice, or even venting and <laughs> complaining. Um, there's sort of an ongoing awareness, like and now. Yeah, you that's that the and, argument for. But that's the argument for experience no, that no, no, being I'm, there I'm, was a valid experience. But it's it's not an argument for whether she really had the. Uh, whether she really could have made it on her own without that association. I'd like to assume that a woman like Hillary Clinton, of that uh, intellect and that kind of drive, that kind of determination and experience, you know, uh, high performing um, and and driven, uh, would have made it on her own. Yeah. I think if, I mean, well, I would have liked to have seen that you know? alternate reality in which Hillary Clinton was the, really did try to make it on her own and didn't work through a man to get where she was. I mean, maybe she's responsible for Bill's uh, success, well, but I, I would have liked to have seen something. the other Hillary Clinton. And I mean, what interests me about Sarah Palin, and, and uh, as my idea of what I would like to see for the first woman vice president or president, is, is someone who really did it uh, in the independent way, who um, achieved without using a man as leverage. Well, I just would like some time for anybody to note that a man had risen and then say, but you know what? You know, there's no way he could have done that without his wife. She's awesome Wait, that's and a, it's a big cliche. People always say that. No, but you know that's what? They the, don't say that's it. the old-fashioned cliche it. that behind every uh, successful man there's a woman. Right, but people I mean, people have always said think that. Think of the, the formulation. So you just, you know, you basically um, just agreed that the, the two, you know, go hand in hand. That you know, a woman is supportive of a man, and a man is supportive of a woman, or partners are supportive of partners. Um, but it, you know, it's nobody. Nobody says that they wish the man could have done it on his own, you know, it's, it's, he, you know, sure, he made it this far, but imagine if he had to yeah, fold but, his own laundry yeah. and make his own meals and... Well, but there's a difference between partners household. supporting each other and helping each other and then taking alternate turns at the presidency. But I mean, I don't have one any, goes in front and partners do that all the time. I have, you know, two good friends who made a deal. First, they'd move to one city for one person's career, and then after, you know, establishing, they'd arrange for transfer and move to another city for the other person's career. Like, that is well, normal right. to me. That sounds like the kind of partnership that I, you know, see yeah. as ideal. 
And I, I know that in the modern world, couples are going to have relationships like that. I mean, they're going to be these fabulous power couples. I'm a little afraid of that. I'm a little afraid of power congealing around too few people. And one thing that I like about Sarah Palin is that her, you know, her husband is a fisherman. You know, he's in a completely different uh, area. I, I, you know, they, not that they don't support each other, but that they're not working as a partnership to attain power within the family. I think there's something troublesome about that. You know, we have term limits on the president. And I think if there had been an idea that, um, uh, you know, uh, married couples were going to take turns being president, that uh, there would have been limits on that as well. It's just so funny because there really, there, there is such a history of sort of succession in this country, but really, you know, all the time. Um, and it usually is a male thing, I mean, until recently, that uh, men would, would take up the mantle of the family business, and sometimes the family business is politics, and you have a lot of dynastic families yeah. uh, in this country. Yeah. And, you know, nobody really had such a problem with it until a woman was running. Like, I'm not saying that that it's not problematic to go Bush, Clinton, Bush, Clinton, um, but mm-hmm. I think that it's got to be more than just problematic in the abstract. I think it has to be problematic in the real. Um, and I think that looking at Hillary Clinton as a, as a candidate in this campaign and um, juxtaposed with, you know, the other dynasty, like... <laughs> I'd rather have a Clinton dynasty than a Bush dynasty if I mm-hmm. can vote, which I cannot. Disclaimer, because I'm Canadian. Oh. Right. So don't let me get too fresh here. Um, <laughs> your company. Yeah, you you need to know your place. I do. Um, oh, but I you do. know when when the first President Bush, when his son became president, he retired off into his. Uh, place in Maine, and he didn't advise the president. He didn't like to hang out in the White House and interact with him constantly. That would have been very strange. But, I mean, I think that he he certainly served a purpose of of sort of uh, assisting and and being an elder statesman, Um, and uh, Bush and Clinton uh, both uh, banded together to to do good works outside the... Yeah, I think that was appropriate. Yeah, I think that's I think installing him in the White House as a major advisor would have been, would have been odd. I mean, again, I I, I think that, you know, it's after the sort of the the behavior of President Clinton and the debates about it, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it deserves a little bit more analysis uh, than, than probably we can do here. Um, I, but I do, I do think that seeing him as a liability on the campaign trail is, is different than seeing him as a, a liability, as a source of information and institutional no- knowledge and experience. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a, as someone who has relationships, like a lot of diplomacy is obviously relationships and, and dealing with people. And if that's something he has a talent for, like I would rather see that tapped. I don't, I don't see a yeah. reason to banish him because uh, people are nervous that he might uh, get too big for his britches. I mean, let's, we're talking about a former president here and, and one with yeah. uh, quite considerable gifts. So rather Well, I mean, that's a, it's an argument about term limits, too, if you, if you want to say that. But, you know, I wanted to, to pin you down on whether you thought it was exciting uh, to have uh, Sarah Palin as the VP for McCain. Well, I mean, I don't find the notion of, uh, of pro-life slash anti-abortion to be exciting. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the, the incipient rollback of Roe. That uh, that would become actual if. Uh, so do you think president. that there do you, do you think if the, that there's a particular problem with uh, McCain picking a woman who's anti-abortion uh, because she might attract some women voters and women shouldn't be attracted by that? They need to know that if you're anti-abortion, you should be opposed by women, and it would well, be kind of like a trick to pick her because it would attract some women who should know better than to align with that. I think, um, I think that the, the, the fallacy there is that, um, that being pro-life is not a choice that a woman should have. I think the whole point of uh, the pro-choice movement is that it is about choice um, and, and that it is a personal choice for women. Uh, and so I mean, I, I, I agree that, with that, but I'm saying do you think that there's a... Hearing, but I think that... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying generally as a, as a, as a position, as a progressive position, um, mine is the, of a pro, pro-choice position, but I would never, I, I don't equate pro-choice with pro-abortion. 
I equate it with the right to choose right. to have an abortion if you find yourself in that very yeah. difficult and unenviable position. Right. I mean, I agree with all of that, but I, I mean, it, McCain is uh, pro-life, and if we assume he's going to pick a pro-life VP, is it wrong in a special way to pick a woman as the pro-life VP? Well, I mean, I don't think it's, again, wrong is, is relative in a matter of uh, opinion, um, but I don't think it's, I think it is, it certainly pointed, certainly makes uh, a point that um, the many on the right would cleave to, um, and it would probably exasperate a number of women. But I, again, I don't think that, you know, I think what the, this, the Democratic primary showed is that uh, women and, you know, uh, African Americans, like uh, general and African American women resented being treated as a monolithic block that had to mm -hmm. uh, vote in accordance with, the, you know, their race or their sex. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the uh, celebrities making us pay attention to the ele election, you know, s the way we get uh, stirred back. I, I keep talking about what excites us and boredom and so on. I, that's my, I see that as a sort of a theme in our topics. And uh, I wanted to talk, I said I wanted to talk about Bob Dylan, but uh, there's this obsession with all of the different uh, celebrities. Of course, uh, you know, we pay a lot of attention to our celebrities. But I, I was focusing on it because uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. There was this uh, interview with Bob Dylan about, uh, you know, he has an art uh, exhibit and some things of that sort, and the reporter kind of pushed him uh, in the very end to uh, act, to say what he thought about the uh, the current election. And um, he said something that then got reported as if he had endorsed a candidate, as if he'd endorsed Barack Obama, which, I don't, which he had never done anything like that in the past. And, uh, you know, I was just looking at that quote and thinking, you know, he, he didn't endorse him. In fact, I think he was sort of uh, uh, standing as a kind of a, a criticism of uh, celebrity endorsements. I mean, just to say a little bit of what the quote was, you know, he's asked about the election and he said uh, some sort of enigmatic Bob Dylan-esque kinds of things. Uh, you, you know, right now America's in a state of upheaval. Poverty is demoralizing. You can't expect people to have the virtue of purity when they are poor. I mean, as an answer to what you think of the election, that's awfully all over the place and not uh, not really focused on any candidate. And then he goes on to say, but we've got this guy out there now who's redefining the nature of politics from the ground up, Barack Obama. He's helping redefine, he's redefining what a politician is, so we'll have to see how things plan, play out. And that was reported as, as an endorsement. I think, uh, you know, it, it was just sort of vague, uh, non-committal response uh, to, to a question by a reporter who wanted to push it on it, push it on him. And I, I think he, he, he just danced all around it and had very little to say, but happened to well, name one of the candidates. Well, well, hold and on that got reported that, all over the place. That was as, last week, as, right? That was last week that that, yeah, that yeah, happened? Yeah, over the weekend, yeah. So if it wasn't an, an endorsement of Obama, wouldn't Bob uh, Dylan have spoken up and, and his, his publicist would have said, actually, no, Bob no. Dylan is not Oh, no, no. I don't think that's how Bob Dylan operates. I think he's very enigmatic and mysterious and wants everyone to talk about him. That's why, you know, he, he these sort of ten sort of mis mysterious sentences kind of tumbled out of him and you know the name Barack Obama is in the middle of it all and then you have to interpret his words I mean well here's something it's you sort don't of like have we, to oh wait let me just say one more thing is that uh, he's been saying enigmatic things that we've been obsessed with interpreting for years and he doesn't make much of a point of coming back and trying to get us to understand exactly what we think I mean his game is sort of to uh say things and let us try to figure out what it meant you know, I'm um, so honestly, I don't think he's at all the sort who would correct that, but I don't think that was an endorsement. I'm, I'm totally, I'm probably like <laughs> precluding uh, all sorts of uh, future partnerships on a number of bases by saying that I actually don't know much about Bob Dylan's music. I'm more of a Springsteen girl, um, uh, but uh, who also endorsed Obama. But, um, but what I will say is not in question is that uh, his son, Jesse Dylan, is the, mm -hmm. was the director for the uh, Yes We Can music video. And that was so, a great video. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, what, no matter what you think, it's very tuneful, and it was shot beautifully. It was beautifully yeah. done. It was very artistically done. Although when I look back at it now, I have this sense of nostalgia that, uh, oh, remember how we felt back then? Those are like the back early days of enthusiasm. Things of, uh, what? Back in February. I mean, it came out, what, like yep. February 1st? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I look back on that as like this sort of golden age of Obama uh, deification, you know, when things uh, had this sort of mysterious uh, religious quality. And since then, he's been taken down a peg. He's been made more the flawed human being. And it seems a little weird that we were sort of so daffy back then. Well, I when um, women were fainting, people were fainting. Well, okay, let's and talk about the fainting. Having... I think it's important to to put the fainting in context. The context of yeah. standing in lines for uh, many hours in some, I guess, in South Carolina, it was hot. Not having something to eat, then get finally getting into the place after you've been frisked, and then there's a warm up speech, and then there's another speech, and the candidate's running late. Like I don't know, I might want to sit down. But see, you're bringing it all down to earth. You're saying, oh, even back then, the fainting wasn't about loving him in this. I think that the fainting, you know, could have been, or but you know, it's all part and parcel. Standing, waiting in line is about loving. You know, I mean, him. it's kind of but funny to say, oh, back in February they were fainting from the heat, and now they're not. I know, but well. I mean, I honestly think that, you know, the, the, the last big rally was in Portland. It was like a week and a half ago. There were, what, 75,000 people. Like, the, there's no shortage of love for Barack Obama, and, and that's great. I also think it's great that his tires have been kicked a little bit. Like, I think, mm-hmm. you know, shiny sports cars are nice, but you want to drive them around the block. Um, and- I, I think he did a, an amazing job of holding up over time to some really severe attacks, sure. basically the Jeremiah Wright stuff. But uh, but I, I still have to say that looking back at that Yes We Can video, to me now, it seems... Uh, it seems a little wistfully nostalgic and, and odd. But that's so interesting. I don't that think you, you could put something out like that now. I, I think it's so interesting that you, you're sort of nostalgic about um, the hope for Yes We Can, but he's actually gone and gotten the nomination, so he's like that much closer to right. Yes We Can. Will right. I am's speech at the, uh, at the Webby's was um, yeah. something to the effect of, you know, now we really can, or now we've shown we can. It had to be five words and... <laughs> Yeah. I don't have right. it exactly, but it was something to that effect. Yeah. Now we know we can. Now we know we can. There you go. I mean, so well, I mean, yeah, back when hope, all you have is hope, you like do that. have these kind of dreamy, uh, you, you do have a certain presentation of yourself. And when you're actually at the point where you really have to do something, you know, things are much more realistic. And you talk about uh, more down-to-earth things. And that really is a sign of success. So well, you know what? I, I do. I'm hoping to win the lottery. When I actually <laughs> do win the lottery, I can assure you it'll be better than hoping to win the lottery. <laughs> yeah, time. it is better, right? Yeah. It's better to actually win and to actually have to do it. Although you have to figure out how to do it well. It's you know, you it's know. like the, the notion of happily ever after. I mean, to to branch into musical theater here, as I know all of our viewers were hoping we would do. Um, that's one of the conceits behind one of my favorite musicals, which is Into the Woods by Stephen Sondheim. Is this is this resonating? Is this hidden anywhere? I've never seen Into the Woods, but I know what it is. Okay. I know it's a collection of a, a bunch of fairy tales with Stephen Sondheim. Right, right, exactly. It's sort of a, it's, it weaves a whole bunch of different um, characters from fairy tales into it. But the whole point is that Act One gets to happily ever after, and Act Two is ever after. And the fact that you know that you get to happily ever after, but then you're not dead; so you're still going on, and so it's, it's mm-hmm. where you go from there. That's why you know romantic comedies always end with yeah. the kiss, yeah. and they don't yeah. begin that way. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of the way the old Robert Redford movie, The Candidate, ended. You know, you have this candidate that everybody didn't, puts their dreams into. And then in the end, you see him in the car just basically looking, having this weird look that meant, now we actually have to do it. Uh, what are we going to do? I saw um, The Manchurian Candidate. Yeah. It's a different kind of candidate. Oh, The Candidate is a is a great Robert Redford movie that's very much uh, very similar to the, the situation with Barack Obama, where you have this uh, aspiring candidate who came out of nowhere and but then actually gets the nomination so well i'm you know but I'm then it's quite a different matter you know the the kinds of things you need to do to get people enthused about you early on are very different from what you have to do in the end to you know close the deal and people said he had trouble closing the deal you know hillary was doing very well in the end so right but the I whole mean, deal closing thing it, didn't listen, go that I'm, well i defended hillary clinton more than many let's just say that <laughs> but um but she didn't close the deal right i mean at the end of the day as as uh, Tim Ruff- Russert has his want to say, in a Jeffersonian democracy, you know, that one vote can well, push well, over the threshold. But vote. she was really good in the closing. The problem was that she so significantly botched the early phase that she could never make up the difference. But he looked bad in the closing phase, which isn't very helpful for him. You know what? I mean, I think that 
we're talking about uh, something that happened a week and a half ago, but and then yeah. in the same breath talking about how different things were uh, with such a different rosy hue back in February. So fast forward a few months, I think mm -hmm. we're going to see all sorts of changes uh, over the next few months uh, as we, we head into the general. Yep. I know, and I, I have more uh, confidence that he'll pull that together and do that well than that uh, McCain will. Yeah, I mean, I um, my uh, what I'm looking at, I'm I'm almost less interested in McCain uh, mm -hmm. than I am in the right because I think that uh, how the right performs over the next few months will be really interesting and critical to the election. Yeah. Will they you pull know, together uh, and and how? You know, um, yeah. where will they, they've got, there's right. a massive, the masses uh, of, of resources that they, that in 2004, that were, yeah. were brought to bear uh, to, to, to buttress the Swift Boat campaign. I mean, how will that, those resources be allocated? Um, how will, uh, how will talk radio, like Rush Limbaugh, like how will he Yeah, I was going to say, it? Rush Limbaugh has been saying that this election isn't going to be about McCain at all. It's just going to be a referendum on Barack Obama. So the whole thing is going to be about whether you can knock Barack Obama down, make people, um, you know, lose uh, trust in him, and basically to be all about whether you're for or against him. And McCain will just slide through, or he won't slide through. Well, you know, I mean, it's but it, it's not like the the right is going to be passive. <laughs> there are people that there, you know, people are vested in the outcome. Well, they're going to attack Barack Obama. Right. So the, so, but it's just interesting. It'll be interesting to see how. I mean, we we, we emailed a little bit about the uh, Edie Hill's uh, terrorist fist jab um, comment. Oh yeah, and yeah. and that and the fact that there was like an instant reaction and an instant apology, and and then connected or unconnected, it's it's not officially clear. But um, you know, there was a reshuffling at Fox that did not accrue to her benefit. Um, but I think that that sort of uh, comment is, is is something that you would have seen on Fox, you know, six Years months ago, ago. wouldn't have gotten mm -hmm. the same kind of reaction. Media Matters still would have been outraged, but would it have made a difference at Fox? Would there have been an apology at Fox? Yeah, well, there is this thing these days to find little things and then to make a big deal about them. Anytime Barack Obama misspeaks or someone at Fox uh, strings some words together and throws something in there that's uh, that's off, well, right, uh, but this, then people but jump all over calling that. the... the, the uh, the gesture between the, the Michelle uh, and Barack Obama, the, the fist pump that everyone was so excited about, to to uh, query whether it's a terrorist fist job. Yeah, but she didn't say that it was. It was just a teaser, and she just listed a whole bunch of things that it could be. Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? And she ended know, are you a, whatever are you a terrorist, terrorist blogging hat? It was just like, like where does that come from? Where, where it was just a dumb little joke. Oh, okay. I don't think it's ever. I think a it was joke. just a dumb. It, it was part of a question. Nowhere. It was a teaser. She wasn't saying he was a terrorist. I, I, but okay, I, mean, I, really I do think that there is this thing there. of planting ideas like that in people's heads. And, you know, you, I think that there are from? subliminal you know, things Oh, like see that. it. Wow, it's just a coincidence. It didn't have anything to do with the fact that there are all these madrasa rumors that were pushed about Obama and then the, the question about whether or not he's a Muslim uh, and, you mm -hmm. know, all the, the dark mutterings yeah. and the people who, who make sure to say his name is Barack Hussein Obama and, oh, what is that wrong with that last name? Hmm, let's think. Yeah, I think some of that is deliberate and is intended to plant these ideas and stir up these suspicions. I think some of it is just people on TV that have to chatter constantly, are under a lot of pressure, and they sometimes dribble out something stupid. Right. That Do they, they deserve to be fired? Has a place on, oh, I'm not saying she necessarily deserves to be fired. I'm saying that that the terrorist fist jab remark is typical of sort of uh, 2004 to 2000. And Six early two thousand and seven, I guess, uh, rhetoric on on yeah. the right, and there has been a shift. You know, I was just, I mean, I'm. I, this is all fresh in my mind because I, I just was uh, on a panel last night with uh, Jeffrey Feldman and Eric. Oh, I'm gonna mispronounce his name. I want to say Bowler, but it's Baylert. Eric Baylert, but we say mm -hmm. Bowler. Um, and uh, about uh, Jeffrey's new book, which is called Outright Barbarous, uh, uh, something about the the language of the right. Ring the violent rhetoric of the right wing, and mm -hmm. we were just talking about the different sort of memes and uh, and and themes and and memes patterns and of, of rhetoric and talking points. And I think that you're going to see uh, a subtlety introduced into it that you know that terrorist fist jab doesn't show um, because terrorist mm -hmm. fist jab doesn't work anymore in the same way. 
Or maybe it, maybe it does and maybe it will. I, but I do think that there will be attention paid to that. I think there has to be attention paid to that because this is, this, this is who is going to be, I mean, depending on who your candidate is. But certainly yeah. uh, the Democrats are going to have to be very careful about what the right yeah, does. Well, and how right. they and I, I mean, things. those little things are certainly the kinds of things that people grab onto and put out there in the blogs and the uh, YouTube and so forth. So that's, uh, if, you, if you give any juicy, edible tidbits like that, people are going to jump at them. So if you're going to run a decent uh, TV show or whatever, you have to have people who aren't going to, aren't going to release things like that. It's sure. bad. I mean, you know, I, I want to. It reminds me of what we want to talk a little. I think about Mayhill Fowler, that uh, that blogger. Yes. That, I guess she's a Huffington Post blogger. She is who, indeed uh, our Mayhill. Yes. Yeah, and that uh, you know she got uh, President Clinton to say. I guess she also got Obama she recorded saying that uh, thing that hurt him so much about the Two clinging to the guns, right? Scoops. Yeah, go Mayhill. And then yeah. she also got. Uh, well, she did a great. I mean. It just shows that, uh, you know, the video is always there. The the little people who you might look at and not realize they could hurt you so much, you really can hurt you so much. I think um, that everybody has to be aware that um, public space is public space and that private space mm-hmm. might be public space. Yep. You should probably be careful. Be careful what you put in yep. your email and be careful what you say and all of that. Um, yeah. But, uh, but I think, you know, the, the debate over, over Mayhill was the fact that she didn't identify herself as a journalist. Um you know, to Clinton before he let loose the tire. Now, you know, it's a question of standards, and there's some debate about that. Um, well, wait, does she count as a journalist? I mean, isn't she, don't bloggers uh, go under a different uh, category? Well, I mean, don't this we is, sort of uh, sneak around? I don't know, and the, the, the things operating their journalistic way? body hasn't weighed in on that. Like, you know, there's no, there's no college of, of uh, doctors and physicians. There's no American Bar Association. Like, there's, there's nobody who's, who's is giving anybody... A license to practice journalism, so it's it's murky right now. This is something that people have been grappling with: what makes a journalist a journalist, and what makes a citizen journalist a journalist, and what rules do they have to abide by, that sort of thing. I mean, you know, anybody can walk into a show with a tape recorder. You see that on on YouTube all the time, like shaky handheld uh, mm-hmm. shots from the upper balcony. I love that. That's yeah, sure, but it's it's still uh, just an example of how things are changing. Where 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 sort of the, the no, no flash photography rule is, has now been subverted in, in, in that way through video. Um, but with respect to sort of a, a former president on a rope line at a public event campaigning for his wife, um, yeah, I think that the standard is different. It's different than if uh, I call someone up and I don't identify myself as a journalist and I ask them a leading question and then tape their answer and don't tell them. It's, uh, she had her tape recorder out and she asked him a question. Yes, it was a leading question, but mm-hmm. he didn't exactly need all that much help to um, to be prompted. I mean, he, he went off. I think it's just great that there are all kinds of people out there now with their cameras, with their blogs, uh, doing things that aren't like traditional record uh, uh, reporting. But I do believe but in that they're you know they're pushing the envelope. I think as long, as long as people are trying to get power and have power, like President Clinton or Barack Obama. Um, I have no sympathy with them when uh, people catch them saying whatever they say. I think we should catch them in all sorts of ways and use it in uh, in, in new ways. And it might be uh, inappropriate for the New York Times or the uh, uh, Washington Post to write about things in a certain way. And they have to have a certain style of professional ethics to preserve their reputation. But I think it's just fine that there are all kinds of citizens out there doing different uh, kinds of uh, things sure, that I, I challenge power wanna, in new ways. I don't have a problem with what, what May, uh, Mayhill having recorded the, uh, the speech uh, that Obama gave at the private fundraiser, and I don't have uh, a problem with the fact that Mayhill uh, you know, recorded that um, by President Clinton, although I, I think that generally speaking as a, you know, as, as a, as a journalistic entity, like I, I think it, you, you know, you go and you, you state who you are and, and who you represent and, um, you know, allow yeah. everybody to know everything at, at all times. But, um, but I think that, uh, you know, when you go into the, the gray area of how things are reported, right? Like who's going to make sure that things are reported accurately? Who, who's going to make sure that corrections are corrected and corrected quickly. Well, it's a marketplace of ideas. You know, you just have so many people writing, everybody monitoring everyone else, that it naturally works out that there are these checks. Uh, well, it's built I, yes into the new no. system. I mean, I think that, you know, I've had, I've had sort of 
I can recall situations where you see like the, the first headline go out in a big blast and then everybody picks it up and then the correction goes out. Does everybody pick up the correction? You know, is everybody being that vigilant or, or is everybody who is blogging uh, doing it full time? They might get called away to their real job. So I think that these are the things that you have to look at. You know, what, what level of commitment is there to accuracy? What level of commitment is there to transparency? Transparency and what level of commitment is there to accountability? Yeah, Those are the like the. I the think the corrective process. I think the corrective process is uh, much more powerful now, much more than it was before, where the newspaper published some big article on you, and then you were lucky if you got a correction right. on a corrections page that no one would see. Absolutely. It works much better now. Right, I, and, and that's you know that's one of the things that I spend my day doing, which is you know reading yeah. stuff critically and and you know where where things have been framed incompletely or with bias or that sort of thing, making note of that. And, yeah. you know, and the three people who read my blog are really appreciative. So. <laughs> now I was going to shift gears a little a bit and talk about this uh, article that was in the New York Times. This is about, uh, I, I guess I could tie this to the subject by talking about how, you know, everybody writes about everything these days. And uh, I wanted to bring up the topic of these sort of, uh, these books that people People do some lifestyle change and then uh, write a book about it. There was a, one, the, the most uh, emailed uh, story for several days on the New York Times uh, a, a few days ago, or maybe for the whole week, was about these two couples who had, I don't know, for some reason they were both doing the same thing. One was, uh, as the Times reported it, uh, a Bible-studying, steak-eating right. Republicans yeah. from yeah. Char Charlotte, North Carolina, and the others were backpacking multigrain northerners from Boulder. And both of these couples did essentially the same thing, and both have books that they're writing about this. And the subject is that they, they were married couples who found themselves not having a, a good sex life. And so they made an agreement to have sex every day. I don't know if it, both of them was for a year, but one of them at least was for a year. We'll have sex every day for a year, uh, and, and then this was like a contract to do that. And then, uh, well, well, that's interesting. That's it's sort interesting. of an interesting, interesting idea. I feel like, you know, well, maybe you might want to try that at home, but these people don't just do it. They also write a book about it. I mean, the well, idea like that. that these people are going to say something interesting about that experience. Wait, I don't know. But is, to me, is it's such appalling. a contract enforceable? That's like a contract. What? That's a contract for personal services. Is that, I mean, is that enforceable? No, no, it's not an enforceable yeah. contract. But I think that they, they have a book they're trying to produce together, right. so they're pretty they're pretty earnest about doing it. They might be lying in their book. Who knows? Who kept track of whether they really did it every day? But I mean, Perhaps the point is that record. they're able to get the New York Times to write an article about them to get a lot of publicity for a book. I mean, well, I, I tend to think there are a lot of people writing sex. much better books out there who aren't getting read. And here are these people generating this ridiculous project for themselves and then producing a book that I just can't believe is a good book. I don't know. Maybe uh, but that's, uh, that's what we're asked to read these days. Well, I know. There's, well, we're asked to, to read a lot more than that. I mean, there's plenty of options. But they get the PR is what I'm saying. They well, get yeah, the PR. Sex sells. And then, sex what? sells. Sex sells, but I don't know. I'm not going to buy that. Uh, well, I can't believe uh, people would want to... Uh, to read so there was another one uh, uh, another one that got a story in the New York Times was a uh, was about these people who were living in this uh, apartment in New York like a really nice apartment in New York but they were trying to have a no impact lifestyle so that they like they weren't allowed to use toilet paper. they were living on Fifth Avenue but they couldn't use toilet paper or they right I remember that know. that's like that's and it was sort of like oh about, yeah. these are and and yet uh, I mean you could see it was a book project it was sure. a book project with a built in uh, you know hook for uh for pr and i just uh i don't know why the new york times especially keeps taking the bait on these things well it's because and it's, i don't know who unusual. reads these books they, they gotta what? fill a paper every week you know or every day rather yeah but i think that yeah, it does um, get people it gets people talking about it i mean if it's the most emailed story that's why they're going to do it right. again well i have to say that you know to the extent that the no impact book has a couple tips that'll that'll help people uh unclutter their environmental lives then power to it yeah. you know I yeah. I, I try yeah. to cancel magazine subscriptions and I, I'm, I'm a media <laughs> reporter so I guess I shouldn't say yeah. that but I have I have asked uh, some people to not send me stuff because you know what I can see it online or I can get a PDF and, and I don't I don't like yep. generating that kind of waste I mean of course the book itself is the waste sure well yeah but I don't know it's an, it's an industry you know, and yeah. then there will be people who will read it. 
Yeah. And maybe a yeah. bestseller, even who knows. So you you were talking about this um, stunt. You used the expression stunt journalism, and you brought up the the article that Christopher Hitchens wrote about uh, going to a spa and yeah. getting his well, no, no, no. body I mean, waxed. In the context, I just use that as an example, like as saying you know that that it's 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 what somebody will do that so and, and tell you about it so you don't have to. And I made a joke yeah. about you know a guy getting his back waxed, and then that made me think of. Christopher Hitchens' series, I think it was a three-part yeah. series, uh, yeah, yeah. on, on uh, yeah. grooming and deforestation, yeah. um, which he could <laughs> completely turn into a book. He's Christopher Hitchens. He could spin that experience into you a book. You know, I guess, to so me, it's sort of like, like, how good are they at doing the writing? I mean, if they have a great writing style, if they're comic about it, especially if they're self-deprecating about it, as Christopher Hitchens was. Not that he's always self-deprecating, but he was on the subject of Not doing things first, to his adjective perhaps I would use for Christopher Hitchens but I, th- I mean they no, not usually but when he was talking about his like bloated uh, carcass or whatever he called it he was funny he was self-deprecating and right. funny right <laughs> but that's just an article I mean what I like make yeah, it an article don't, like expand it into, into whole... books people, people yeah. regularly do that yeah 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 we tend to write in these little uh, pieces of things uh, nowadays with blogging and so forth. But but books continue, and I guess people people are still buying books. Hey, did you get a Kindle, by the way? No, no, I uh, the little electronic. I like, uh, I like carrying stuff around. You know, I mean, I after carry just around saying the that I um, yeah, but you know, I like I like folding books like pages yep. and bookmarks and you know and reading them on the subway. And I know I'm I'm a luddite. I'm a luddite. No, I, I'm not a Luddite myself, but I got a Kindle and I didn't really like it. I think the argument for the book really is very strong. I mean, my biggest problem with the Kindle was just that it looks, the screen is like an Etch-a-Sketch, you know, it's right. gray on gray. It just doesn't look good. I, I want things to look good. It's convenient in, in many yeah. respects, and I have no problem with convenience, but, um, you know, one of the one of the great things about, um, about uh, paper journalism is um, you don't need a wireless signal. I run around looking for a wireless signal you know, half my life. So uh, mm-hmm. I had a novel experience on a plane uh, a, a week or so ago where I took a magazine on with me and I read the thing cover to cover and I like highlighted it and then I yeah. wrote about it and it was just so novel. I was like, oh, I'm yeah, this. this is a novel yeah. too. How pleasant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, there's this idea that the, um, where did I read this article? Oh, there's an article, new article in The Atlantic about how you know, reading on the internet is kind of restructuring our brains, and the idea of actually sitting and and reading through something in a linear way is, uh, you know, it, it's something we were adjusted to doing, and we're really losing that feeling. The sense that you could just flip all over the place is um, is actually changing our the structure of our brains. I actually um, <laughs> met uh, that make that reminds me of the, these guys I met at this conference I was at two weeks ago called the Mesh Conference, oh. and uh, it's uh, Canada's internet conference. And their mm-hmm. company is called Spree, and they have this um, application that uh, filters through using an RSS. It filters through, um, you know, media, and the way it presents it, it presents the words sort of. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. You know, like the Right Now video by Van Halen, where the words like or subtrain. Well, no. Not oh yeah. But the, yeah. Know, the words come up, uh, or yeah. you know, anyhow. So it's sort of like that. The words um, sort of like. Um, come up, they kind of said, float up at you, um, yeah. and, and in such a way that it like doubles the the amount of words you're able to consume. I tried it, and it was it was really amazing. Okay. I it, I didn't sort of suffer any loss. Of well, that would be great. So you mean there's a new there's a way of presenting text that could be done on a computer screen that would cause things to float up and then fade up and fade back. Yeah, and it would like enable you to read eyeballs, twice as fast. Kind of. That's how. That's how the best I can explain it. It's called Spree. Oh, S-P-R-E-E-D, I love that. And we will we will link to it. They will be so excited. Oh, wow. But it was, I'm it was excited very about cool. that. It was very you cool. You know, speaking of things on the internet, I was going to raise one last topic. I think we have time to throw in one more topic. Okay. Um, I want to talk about Judge Kosinski and, uh, uh, of the Ninth Circuit and the, the, the L.A. Times article about his having uh, his own personal website, but it was accessible uh, on the internet that had a, a bunch of, uh, you know, porno pictures. Oh. And the new and the LA Times wrote an article about it, and there's a question about whether this that was sound good. familiar, but it certainly sounds interesting. So I looked at I, you know uh, the, the, one of the blogs, Paterico has uh, has links up where you can uh, you know you can look at all of those pictures and see what the judges' uh, pictures were. But it's a pretty creepy thing to have in the news, to have in the mainstream press, the LA Times, and uh, there's some question about whether. Um, 
whether that ought to have uh, been written about. I mean, what, what is this public humiliation over something that's irrelevant to anything? Wait, what wait, is that? A, a judge has a website, a professional website, with, is, or even a personal website with pornographic photos? And yeah. I sort of think yeah. that's newsworthy. You don't think that's newsworthy? Well, I assume that lots of you men... You put something out there in public as a public figure... Who so there are all these. I guess I was defending funds. Mayhill Flow, uh, Fowler uh, pre presenting any word that President Clinton might happen to say. But do do we really think that uh, anyone who's a public figure? I mean, I assume that a large proportion of the men who are public figures look at porn pictures. And uh, is that all newsworthy? Should that all come uh, out? I don't know. Or it's maybe you know, should maybe it come out of the mattress and someone you know doesn't have a search warrant to get it. It's it's not fair. Well, they put it up. About, it's sort of like if you if leave he, something up where people can get to it on the internet, you are stuck with all the humiliation that can flow from that. And no, the media I don't know. should Shouldn't just be grab careful a hold with of their porn. Like you should have a little bit of care in if you're nervous about your digital footprint. If you don't want people to know you're looking at porn, then. Act accordingly. Uh, that seems really basic. Thirteen-year-old boys have got that down for decades. So you think whatever human if you put something on the well, internet, I whatever the humiliation article, flows from Let me just from make. That. Let me let me be clear. It's his own website, and he yeah. posted photos that were pornographic. Yeah, like there was a photograph of two naked women on their. Um, Hands and knees, you know, like he in the crawling charming. position. I hope and they were wait, wait, let me say, they were painted like cows, like with that kind of black and white uh, pattern of a cow. And these women were on their hands and knees, and you're looking oh. at them from the back, oh. and you can see their genitalia. Right. So that, There's nothing interesting about that. Maybe we should just I looked let at that him picture. have his cow I thought it was born. funny, but... Wait, so, I mean, obviously, it wasn't a, a pornographic site that anybody could uh, find that easily, but once you found it, anybody could go to it. And, you know, he must have put it up because he thought it was funny and wanted, uh, well, wanted I to share it. Maybe it was funny, or maybe it was not funny. Um, and in the way that painting a woman on her hands and knees and while she's naked to look like a cow can maybe not be funny. Well, I mean, I that's another it. question is how, what are the female law clerks going to think of this? What is this going to do to his reputation? Should this be portrayed as this dark, sexist or side to him? Or should he post it? Should he have maybe thought of that before he posted it? I think yeah, people have, have to take a little bit of responsibility <laughs> for what they put online. You know, I put stuff online every day. I take responsibility for it. You know, but, I, uh, but actually, he is taking responsibility for it. And I think, uh, you know, one thing is, uh, so what? This is interesting. This is something I thought was funny. Uh, you know, this is the sort of thing people are interested in. You know, I'm not saying it's uh, profound. It's just a funny thing that I put up to share with people I know. What's the big deal? Or do you think it is a big deal that it actually is a sexist problem? Uh, because you seem to be saying both of those things. Now, oh, another well, angle to I this have, is that he's currently... What I'm saying is I haven't seen it. But but I think well, that put up it's their so game can... to be written about, and he's a public figure. Yeah, he's a judge, so he's a judge. And he happens to be on the reason the LA Times went policy. I just think that it's completely and totally germane. I mean, and, well, it's even more germane when you know, and this is why the LA Times put the article up when they did because the 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 news they had the the um, they had the scoop back in January, but um, they, he's currently uh, Judge Kaczynski is currently presiding over a, an obscenity trial where the government is seeking uh, criminal is criminally prosecuting this man Ira Isaacs who um, does you know really hardcore pornography obviously the government chooses to go after the most hardcore stuff much right. worse Real I think cows. than those cows but uh, but so that makes uh, his uh, I don't know that makes the story relevant in some special way yeah I think it, like I said I think it's germane you know it's different than uh, a college kid posting what he perceives to be a funny photo. It's different than an artist creating art mm -hmm. and what does the woman, naked woman painted as cow <laughs> on her hands and knees symbolize? You know, buy the cow <laughs> and don't give away the milk for free? I don't know. That's oh, the old that's adage, thing. Yeah. But, um, you know, a judge paid for public funds, adjudicating over public policy, a public figure adjudicating an obscenity case. I think it's relevant. I certainly don't think that he's entitled to any, any standard of privacy when he puts it on the web. You he know? put it on the web, that's it, yeah. I, I just, it was sort of in a back page. It was a little bit hard to access, but it was available if you looked hard enough. I mean, I just don't know. You know, sometimes people don't have the greatest judgment. 
That's why I'm really yeah. glad the internet sort well, of came along judge, after want to have judgment. I was in college. Yeah. But, uh, um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, you know, is there some sort of an idea that if you're a judge, you have to be serious all the time? You can't have a playful side. You can't fool around. Okay. You have to... Uh, can we can we accept that playful side can have a broad meaning? And it can mean, you know, <laughs> I like singing show tunes with my law clerks. And mm-hmm. it can also mean I like uh, cow porn. Um, I think that maybe <laughs> I could draw a pretty bright line between those two. So yeah. playful, you know, uh, I'd hate to think well, that... Well, but it's not like he was sending these pictures in email to his law clerks. Obviously, that would present a sexual harassment problems and so on, but it was his personal website. It wasn't his official... You know, but I, can, I just don't know what, what to say about a judge who has a personal website with naked lady cow pictures on it. I really don't. Like, surely someone... Maybe a, a, with a bit better judgment could be appointed. <laughs> you know, he's someone that was on has been on the short list for a, a conservative president to appoint to the Supreme Court. So yes, he's a very you know what, I, I have no judge. doubt that he'll be very seriously considered. Um, and uh, and uh, wow, fabulous! I mean, it made it made me think back to when Clarence Thomas went up for his uh, confirmation hearings. And it became an important subject that he had rented porno movies. And there was discussion in the confirmation hearings back in 1992 for Clarence Thomas uh, that he had rented this particular uh, porno film. And uh, Although the pro- there was also an additional problem there that he had referred to it in talking to someone in well, his right. office. Right, and there was this, so the whole, was again, it all comes down to judgment and appropriateness, you know, and, and, and the fact that these are... Important positions. The, the whole and I mean, obviously, it's, it's also judgment important matters. that you... I'm sorry, go ahead. It's, it's a judge, so judgment matters. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's also important that you don't do things that make women feel that they don't belong in the workplace. But yeah, if you just know what's on someone's... they are looking for work as a cow model, in which case, that's <laughs> lucky for them. Yeah, in that workplace, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're kind of over an hour, so maybe I shouldn't raise one more topic, but uh, did you want to say something about whether there would be any discussion in the presidential campaign about the Supreme Court appointments? Yes, I or would you, hope so. You was- I would hope so. I think that uh, that's a huge issue. That'll have long-ranging impact. Um, you know, uh, Justice Breyer is... Uh, wait, no, Stevens. Stevens is uh, 88. And, uh, that's He's very old. Uh, and, um, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 75. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is also quite old. And I, I heard from someone who saw her last week that she looked very frail, very bent over, and had trouble uh, holding her head up. Well, I, I certainly hope that she is all right. She's, you know, a, a small woman. Um, yeah, she always looked very frail. So but, even when she was first appointed back in, you know, whenever it was in the 90s, um, she looked very thin. She looked very... She did look frail all along. But I think that, um, yeah, the issue of the court, like, that will become a general election issue, or it should. I mean, McCain has made it, it very clear not. that he... It wasn't in 04. The they didn't talk about George it in Bush. Yeah, they didn't talk about it in 04. Um, I don't know that they well, will they talk should've. about it. And they definitely should now, and they definitely, I think, will now, because, you know, I don't know if you saw Jeff Tubin's article uh, in The New Yorker two weeks ago, but he mm-hmm. sounded the alarm crystal clear. And I had actually interviewed him... The day, uh, the day of McCain's uh, very under the radar speech about um, what kind of judges he would appoint it was on May six during the primary. It got almost uh, no attention, but uh, you know, I blogged about it. Was, it. Yeah, well, I saw, I saw it too, and my thought was, wow, this is extremely vague language. Um, what exactly is his judicial philosophy? And so I asked Jeff Tubin what he thought, and he said, you know, make no mistake, he's using the code words uh, for the for the the hard right that he's going to appoint judges in the in the tradition of George W. Bush, and that yeah. the, the court will change. I, I, I mean, tried that's, to that's ask... That's the central point of, uh, of Tubin's book, The Nine, uh, is, yeah. is the fact that the court well, is I think that's on a the pretty verge alarmist of a change. Book. I, I think that that book uh, really is exaggerated and alarmist about uh, the court and insulting to alarmed. a lot of the judges. i got to say, well, no, I, I mean, I thought it was a great book, and, and I found it... I mean, it was uh, one of the best things about it was it got me excited about law in a way, in the way that I was in law school when I was excited about law and when it wasn't finals and homework. Um, but I just, you know, I found myself highlighting a whole bunch of stuff and going back and, and putting well, bullets in yeah. pages. 
Um, he, and this I mean, is also because I'm, you know, I my legal tradition is Canadian. I was educated in Canada. Um, but I think that I thought the book was pretty smart and pretty good, and I think that there's really no there's no debate about the fact that the, the court is poised for a change and that it's highly likely that uh, a new judge will be appointed in in the next four years, in the in the term of the next yeah. president. And so uh, I and think that it's will a, swing the court. That yeah, will swing I the think court. it's it's if the uh, the two liberal justices leave, or if one of those that you mentioned yeah, uh, leaves, if, if if they aren't uh, replaced by a democratic president, it will really have a big impact on the court. So right. I think so that, that if you want, if issue. you like the current uh, kind of equilibrium that exists on the court, that I think is kind of balanced with conservatives, liberals, and swing voters. If you like that kind of balance that exists, that has existed then uh, you should want the Democratic president to make the next couple of appointments. But if you want to solidify a conservative kind of a court, giving those next two appointments, if those are the retirees, uh, to giving those to uh, McCain would make a would make a big difference. But I'm not actually convinced that McCain really would go with a, a complete conservative. Right, I think he might maverick. try to maintain the balance. Well, as, as far as his, you know, he's voted with, uh, with Bush on, on uh, judicial appointments, and he gave a speech, and he telegraphed what his intentions were, and his intentions were, you know, no activist judges, which is code for overturn Roe, and uh, and um, you know, stick with uh, stick with. I I understand why I people mean, who it, support. I understand why liberals it much read I that. I recommend the article, but it's uh, it's more what? than just Roe. It's about capital punishment. Yeah, it's about I affirmative know. action. I mean, it's yeah. it's a it's a rollback move. If you want to roll back, but as many do, I think the I think that the idea, if you are conservative and you want the court to be conservative, I don't think you should be that confident that McCain is going to really stock the court with real conservatives. I think he's likely to actually take a more moderate position. So, I actually wouldn't expect him. To, I mean, I wouldn't trust it if I wanted a liberal court, but I wouldn't trust it if I want. I wouldn't trust McCain if I wanted a conservative court either. So, well, I but mean, I think we it, know that Barack Obama will appoint liberals sure. to the court. Well, yeah, but I mean, I don't think that you can hear McCain's speech and and hear the position that he's taken and then give him the benefit of the doubt of saying, well, maybe he's just you know saying that now. I mean, I would if if, he, if that's what. Well, then you know, I, I think that you probably should uh, consider that a mark against his credibility if he's if he's saying one thing and planning to do another. I think that. What but they all say we want judges that say what the law is, that don't make the law. That is, Those are just stock phrases that could mean anything when it comes right down to picking the actual right, individual that's that why you're going they're, to they're appoint. carefully selected. And, I mean, Jeff Tubin really right. broke down the speech that, um, that McCain gave on May 6th and, and demonstrated the, you know, the reference. He unpacked the references that McCain okay. made. That would have gone over the heads of people who weren't sort of familiar with the hot button. Uh, well, I did, uh, we're kind of running long. Okay. I'm going to link to an R, to my response to that uh, to, to that McCain speech, and I also talked to McCain on one of the blogger phone calls on exactly this subject. And I don't think that I mean I think Tubin is a liberal who really wants a liberal court and is sounding the alarm because he has that particular agenda. I don't think you can nail down McCain like that, and I think that when it comes to picking the actual individual who will go on the court, you can pick someone with conservative credentials who will say those conservative things like uh, uh, n- not being activist and so forth, who will actually end up in the middle and will be someone sure, like similar Sandra to O'Connor. Kennedy or O'Connor. I'm surprised everyone. Yeah. No, I, I'm, yeah, I, listen, so. I'm, I, I agree, but I think that, I think that for, for voters and, and people interested in the main issues of this election, the, the reality is the Supreme Court is poised for a shift. And that shift will come in the form of one or more justices appointed by the next president. That's yeah. But it, but it, it, if if we have a liberal president and the retirees are are uh, Stevens and Ginsburg, then replacing them with, with liberals actually won't make a difference. Right. It won't be a shift. So if you don't want a shift, you should want Obama making the appointments. That's a good point. If you right. do want a shift to something really conservative, you might get that from McCain, but you actually might not. You know, I think all I can go by is, is sort of uh, is the speech that he gave, and, and I, I thought that uh, Tubin's reasoning was was pretty sound. It certainly made sense to me, and, and I thought it was a pretty reasonable uh, alarm bell. Okay, well, I, I'm going to have to uh, disagree with you on all that, right. but I'm not going to take another shot at poor Jeffrey Tubin. Yes, we love uh, Jeff Tubin. We love the tubes. You like the, the tubes. tubes. I do. I do. I'm a fan of the tubes, on record. 
Yeah. <laughs> the tubes. Okay. Let's well, get everybody referring to the inner to tubes. The tubes. That would be awesome. we got to get off the inner tubes okay. now and leave it to the next blogging head. So Fantastic. I think we've gone over our one hour. I'm going to... I'm going to call time on us. Okay. okay. Thanks, Anne. Okay. This was it was great. great talking to you. Likewise. Bye. Bye now.